Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the November board of uh, SWIFT. Uh, delighted to uh, see you again, albeit through the digital medium. Uh, we do apologise for the fact that in a COVID world, we are having to um, cease physical meetings and instead meet digitally. But we do hope members of the public uh, find this nonetheless a useful way of keeping up to date with everything that is going on at the Trust. We've had a board workshop this morning and had an interesting patient story on um, alcohol addiction and rehabilitation. Uh, we then had a, a good discussion on dignity at end of life. Uh, we then had a review of the Ellen Badger uh, business case, which is the subject of a confidential board discussion this afternoon, and then had a really great uh, presentation on the digital innovations that we are pushing ahead with, and in particular the work of the digital hub over at Stratford. And it's a real shame that in these uh, restricted times, members of the public aren't able to see um, all of the great things that with our commercial partner SSC we have been able to achieve over at Stratford in the digital hub, but some really exciting developments over there, which we think will have a real impact on a patient and family lives um, in the future. So we have apologies for absence from Helen Lancaster, who is unwell today. Helen, we, if you are watching, we hope you feel better soon. And uh, any new declarations of interest? OK, the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of October. Was everyone happy with the accuracy of those minutes? Please come off mute if not. OK, I'll duly accept those as read. So we then move on to the matters arising. Um, and the first was uh, to have a discussion on futility and dignity. Um, that did occur this morning and Charles and Katie Hodder um, and Christina Ramos are doing some really great work in driving forward the important but very difficult and challenging issues that dignity at the end of life entail. Um, the next was a digital update to come back to the next workshop, workshop and that indeed occurred this morning. Um, Ad did a more detailed discussion on um, the Ellen Badger project. Um, and then we had uh, a paper to come back um, on the Central England Rehabilitation Unit. Uh, I think we did that last month, so apologies for that. Um, and then the Director of Operations to upload photographs showcasing the digital hub. I believe we've done that. And as I said, we discussed that this morning. Uh, Glenn to bring back the uh, place-based clinical strategy to a future board meeting. Glenn? Yeah, some further internal um, conversations going on around that. So we probably within the next month, two months, we should be able to bring that back. OK, super. Thank you. Um, the next one is for next year, which is the medical revalidation report, including separate trend data. So Charles Keepers briefed on that. Um, and also for next year is and to bring some data within the report on equality and diversity regarding uh, different profiles. So I'm sure and you will do that um, in May of next year. And we'll also ensure that we invite two members of the BAME network um, for uh, who've been allocated pay, uh, places on the national uh, Res Expert Programme to attend a future board workshop um, and that will come back again at the board workshop next year. Helen to ensure a presentation on digital innovation. We did do that uh, this morning and what I've requested this morning is that the board updated every six months on uh, progress in that regard. And Russell, Helen. Sorry, sorry. Russell, could I just could I just come in on that? Sorry, because we, we will be doing a sorry, I wasn't in that part of the workshop. There is a digital launch um, month, um, which we're just finalising at the moment where we will be able to showcase some more of the activity that's going on there. OK, that's great. Thank you very much, Glenn. 
And then on the integrated performance dashboard, um, Helen to bring back to board or board workshop uh, the positive work done with primary care and share with board colleagues. Um, there's a date to be agreed on that, so Helen will brief us uh, when she returns. And then presentation showcasing the digital hub to be brought back to the board. We did in fact cover that off this morning, so um, that was good news. I think it would be great if we can really start to celebrate the digital hub on the website, Glenn. So if I can leave you to find a way of doing that, that would be good news. So um, any matters arising that I've missed? Okie dokie, so we then move on to the calendar of board and board committee meetings for next year. Uh, Sarah? Thank you, and um, happy to take the report as read. The committees have all considered their dates individually, um, so any comments prior okay. to approval, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And uh, it's never an easy task to put together the calendar for the year ahead, and it is somewhat depressing to see your life laid out until March 2022. But um, any questions on the calendar? Everyone happy to note, please come off mute if you're not. OK, thank you very much. We then move on to the update to the annual financial plan and contracts for this year. Um, Kim. Thank you. Uh, Russell. So uh, just to remind the uh, board, uh, we we, um, we took a draft um, plan for the second half of the year back in September based on assumptions uh, around what we were hoping to receive uh, for the second half of the year um, because um, we were still waiting at that point in time for the actual allocations. Uh, the allocations have subsequently uh, arrived and um, we have then been given um, some funding envelopes which have been largely distributed on a system-wide uh, basis. Uh, there is still a national requirement uh, to uh, submit a break-even plan for the second half of the year, um, but based on the allocations given and based on the modelling of uh, expenditure for the rest of the year, the Coventry and Warwickshire Partnership uh, have submitted a deficit plan of £15 million. Uh, pounds. Um, this is yet to be formally approved and accepted by NHSIE, uh, but our share in effect of that deficit uh, plan is £842,000. Uh, this will be the first year in 14 years that I've been here that we have submitted a deficit plan. Um, so, 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 so that that's that that's you know um, it, 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 it's 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 a shame. Uh, the key things really is I've broken down um, the uh, uh, building blocks uh, in terms of, of the income allocations that have been given uh, to us and negotiated really uh, 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 to, to to us as a as a trust, uh, and uh, I've also modelled some expenditure uh, figures there as well. In order to uh, get to that deficit plan, though, we've still had to accept a, a cost improvement target of 1.6 million for the second half of the year as well. Um, the key things to note is that the expenditure forecasts uh, have been based on a 50% um, run rate of uh, COVID spend based on the first six months of the year. Uh, and it was also based on the assumption of best case scenario of R equals one. And, uh, and given the situation that we're in now with you know, a, a national lockdown um, uh, to, uh, later on today, uh, we clearly see that R isn't. Uh, so that basically means that there is a risk uh, around uh, the forecast for the second half of, of, of the year. So I wanted to make sure that the board were aware of, of that. The other key thing to note is that there is still in place a nas uh, uh, nationally elective incentive scheme where we were basically uh, uh, you know, uh, asked to uh, deliver the um, expectations in the phase three uh, uh, restoration uh, uh, work. And um, if we don't deliver those targets, then there was a risk that there will be clawback in terms of the income allocated to us. And as a system, there's a significant uh, financial risk, um, which they're expecting us to manage as a system. 
So if one organisation doesn't deliver those targets, then actually the whole system gets uh, some sort of share of that. Now, I believe there are national uh, discussions still ongoing about whether or not they can actually invoke that incentive scheme uh, or penalty scheme. Um, uh, but again, we, we haven't heard anything uh, different to that. Um, in terms of the paper, what we're asking the board to do is effectively approve uh, the uh, financial plan that we've set out and give uh, Glenn and myself delegated authority to effectively formalise uh, the issue of budgets to the divisions and for you to note the risks and assumptions that this financial plan is based upon. Thank you very much, Kim. Glenn, is there anything you'd like to add? I, mean, I, I refer to actually my chief executive report, but I'm happy to, to just reference it now. As Kim said, this would be for for me the first time that we've we've had a deficit in a, in a long time, and I, I I don't like the notion of what, what will be virtually every provider organisation in the NHS being in deficit, and somehow um, I don't think that adds to the financial control of, of the NHS. So, um, but as Kim said, the reason that it's so is that actually because we didn't claim much in the first part of the year and we've been given a, a lesser share than than our, than our kind of population would would determine for this for the second half of the year and therefore we we slip into a very small level of deficit but it's a deficit nonetheless i think the really the key thing as kim said is is for us to um to not manage the organization in the way that we're being managed so um, to, to actually get prospective budgets into individual divisions rather than this claiming it after you've spent it approach that we seem to be applying to the NHS at the moment. I understand why we've had to do that for the first half of the year. I don't think we should be continuing in that. I'm obviously involved in some of those discussions that Kim referred to. I'd be very surprised if the elective incentive scheme is, is applied in the way that they've suggested, because if it was, and for organisations like us, they would take money off us through that scheme and then have to give it back to us as by way of a top up. So it just seems a bit futile. But we'll we'll see what transpires in the second half of the year. Thank you very much, Glenn. Any questions or perspectives to Kim or Glenn? Uh, Rosemary? Yes, I'd just like to come in and support um, both Kim and um, Glenn's comments here that it's you know, there are some serious risks around um, the figures, particularly with COVID, um, our number being greater than one, you know, it reduces the, you know, the, the elective, potentially reduces elective capacity um, and you know, increases, increases costs. But it is absolutely imperative that we have tight um, financial controls across the organisation. So really encourage us to, you know, stand, you know, stand by these figures and to, you know, to to give um, divisions a clear, a clear, strong message on what's expected for them to deliver. Thank you, Rosemary and Simon. Um, thank you, Russell. I took my hand down pretty much straight away because Rosemary was on the same wicket as I was about to Fine. bat on. But, Super. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so if you're not happy to approve the updated financial plan, Recognising the risks as uh, outlined by Kim and Glenn, please uh, put your hand up. Rosemary, can you take your hand down, please, first of all? Um, please raise your hand if you're not happy to adopt the financial plan. OK, it's duly approved. Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, thank you for what must be a challenging ser series of discussions you must be having with your colleagues. Thank you. Um, we then move on to the revised constitution. Um, it's been, uh, I think, around six years since the uh, Constitution was last revised, and um, the, the Constitution is obviously the, gov the overall arching governance arrangements under which the Trust operates. Um, so we set up, just by way of background, um, a Constitution working group which involved a, a handful of governors, and I'd like to thank all of those that were involved in that process. Um, and um, Bruce uh, from the non-executive uh, side um, to look at all of the different constitutional changes that were required. And under Meg Lambert's um, careful guidance, um, we then um, reviewed all of the different changes. Now, um, the uh, 
consequence of that is at its simplest, um, the working group uh, subcommittee agreed on 99% unanimously on uh, the uh, amendments that were required. There was one issue on governor tenure where there was a difference of opinion. So first of all, I'd like to take um, on page 25 of the pack, the revised constitution um, general amendments, um, which you've all had the opportunity to see in red highlights. Um, are there any questions on the general um, uh, amendments? Bruce. Thank you, Russell. Um, I'm speaking for Sue Whelan Tracy, who's unable to be with us for this part of the board. She asked me particularly to raise one point on this paper and one point on the next paper. So for this paper, her comment is it leaves the public constituency as it is and um, exploring expansion, she thinks, would be wise because uh, it limits the skills available to the board on selection of NEDs. So very strongly recommends if we aspire, which we do, I'm sure in the next few years to be a top trust, we want to be naturally benchmarking with top people. Thank you, Bruce. So this um, was the subject of discussion uh, regarding whether we should have um, an out of county governor, uh, which would then allow us also to have an out of county NED. Um, particularly uh, allowing us to, for example, have people who uh, live in Birmingham to apply to be a NED. Um, I did discuss this with um, Sue the other night, um, but at the moment that um, isn't um, included in the um, amendments. And to be honest, I think trying to make that change now would uh, be problematic. So any other questions from colleagues? OK, so I'll move then to um, approval and I do need um, a, a approval. If you're not happy to approve the general amendment section, um, could you please raise your hand? So I take that as a general agreement to approve, so that will therefore go forward to the Council of Governors. Um, the Council of Governors uh, need to approve it as well for the constitution to be changed. We'll then move on to page 103 of the pack. Um, as I mentioned, there was one issue where there wasn't unanimous agreement, and that was the issue of um, governor tenure. Um, at the moment, uh, we have um, a governor tenure which is open-ended, which means as long as governors are re-elected, um, they can remain a governor uh, for as long as that process continues. Um, so there was a difference of opinion between um, many of the governors and the non-execs on the Constitution Working Group, um, and that's laid out in the paper. Um, so we suggested three potential options. Option number one, which is laid out on uh, page three of five in this part, um, was for there to be no change to the current arrangements. Option number two was that um, all governors should have a maximum term of nine years. And option three was that all current governors should have um, an open ended tenure, given that when they uh, were elected, it was on the basis of open ended tenure. Uh, but for all new governors for March 2022, they would have a maximum term of nine years. Um, so there are three options and unusually I will be asking the board to vote when we get to that stage. I will need a majority, i.e. seven, of um, the board to agree on one of the options. So if I don't have a majority on the first round of voting, um, the option with the least votes will be removed and then I'll ask you to vote again. Um, so questions and perspectives, Bruce. Thank you, Russell. I also, for this comment, speak on behalf of Sue, who's not here. Um, on Governor Tenure, her view is there is unequivocal evidence that all roles in governance need objectivity. So she fought for the open-ended tenure 
and is in favour of everyone nine years. Thank you, Bruce. Rosemary? Um, yes, and further wanted to add to that, that um, NHS providers have very recently come out with a paper on the, on the, on the subject of um, trusts and governor tenure. And again, their view is um, widely recommended that there should be a limitation on the, on the tenure. Um, and really recommending nine years as being the most appropriate. Thank you, Rosemary. Any other perspectives or questions? And um, Charles, is that you? Yeah, I mean, it would would seem to me be to be good practice and well recognised that a, a limited tenure was appropriate. But I just wondered if there were any arguments, uh, you know, to, to, to the opposite for that, because I can't see any. Well, I, I, that's if you look at the paper under option one, um, the impact uh, section on option one talks about the impact of um, uh, the current situation and advantages as, as um, uh, some governors uh, regard it. So I think that's laid out in the paper, Charles. Okay. Um, Rosemary, could I ask you to take your hand down because it confuses me. I apologise. And any other questions or perspectives? OK, um, and that is Kim. Sorry, I was a bit slow. <laughs> I'm trying to get my hand up. Um, yeah, I, I think um, from my perspective, it would be uh, I, I would also support actually having a, a limit. I think it'd be good to get uh, fresh ideas and fresh thoughts. Um, I think whether or not we can do something more around, uh, I suppose, um, encouraging more governors in the build up, really, I think, you know, we need to be pushing for that. Uh, uh, not just the membership, but actually encouraging uh, people to become governors and actively supporting training and development beforehand. So that's what I would uh, ask us to also consider. No, thank you, Kim. And that was uh, discussed um, at the working um, subcommittee and um, there was uh, reference to an anxiety about the way um, we were inducting um, new governors to give them the best chance to actually be able to um, know what the various different uh, working committees that they could join actually uh, do. So that, that point was raised, but thank you. Okie dokie, well, what I'd like then is I'll do each option in turn. Um, so put your hand up, please, if your preferred option on government tenure is option one, and just for the avoidance of doubt, option one, is to maintain the status quo and not amend the provisions on governor tenure in the constitution. Okie dokie, I can't see any hands raised there. Option two, all governors to have a maximum term of nine years, effective from March 2022. Please raise your hand if you um, are in favour of option two. OK, apologies, I will try and count up the number of hands just to make sure I've got this right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sarah, can you just confirm I have ten hands raised? Can you come off mute, Sarah, when you confirm? Yes, the 10? yes, that's right. Yeah, that's okay, right. OK, thank you. And then uh, for completeness, option three, all current governors, if re-elected, reappointed in March 2022 to maintain open ended terms of office with any new governors elected or appointed in March 2022 to have a maximum term of nine years. Please raise your hand if that is your preferred option. OK, so I have a majority for option two, which we will take forward as the Board of Directors preferred option uh, to the Council of Governors. For the avoidance of doubt, if the Council of Governors and the Board of Directors do not agree on the same option, that element of the Constitution will not change. Uh, so it is necessary for there to be unanimity between the Board of Directors and the Council of Governors on any changes to the Constitution. 
So for the avoidance of doubt, if the Council of Governors do not agree with that recommended option or preferred option by the Board of Directors, um, there will be no change to tenure. Thank you very much. So we'll move on then. And Glenn, over to you for the Chief Executive's report. Thank you, Russell. I'll just pull out some highlights. So uh, firstly, congratulations for Kim for a recognition on the influencers fame list, which is very positive. Um, testing. So testing has been um, quite a big uh, news issue, and I've given you a few updates in the past on this, but here's the latest one. Um, and indeed, this week, since I wrote this report, we've seen use of some of the technology I'm referring to here. So the lamp technology, as well as lateral flow technology, is being used for mass asymptomatic testing of the population of Liverpool. Uh, and we will soon move to mass testing of NHS staff more generally. At the moment, we are we are testing staff where there's specific outbreaks as advised by Public Health England, but then also in some of the tier three areas. So in the last week, we've tested um, in, in Nottingham, in, in Derby and in Birmingham. Um, so though that's ongoing, um, this also refers to the need to uh, access home testing kits for the elective pathway um, and the need for rapid testing to uh, assess every patient as they admit acute sites and, and that the deployment of that kit has been a little bit delayed but we should see that deployed here at Warwick over the next uh, week or so um, and this be, has become more all the more apparent in the last few days as there's been um, some network equipment failures at our Coventry lab that, that supports us and the you know, that has led to some significant turnaround delays in getting test results back for those patients who are admitted by the front door, which which does mean that we have to assume those are positive patients until we we can um, have a negative swab. So that that's caused some difficulty in bed management, and rapid testing will certainly solve that. So um, hopefully we will see uh, that improvement in 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 line soon. Uh, I then refer to the Starboard. There's further meeting of that earlier today. I won't go into the detail on, detail of it. NHS providers um, kind of setting the scene for the winter. Um, findings showing that 99% um, of uh, NHS leaders were concerned about the well-being of their staff. I'm not sure. I'm concerned about the well-being of the 1% that they weren't concerned about the well-being, but um, that's another story altogether. But obviously this is a big issue as we go into the winter and no doubt we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we discuss our performance report later. We discussed the system funding, but I won't go into that. Um, and um, I also referenced there the uh, latest uh, roundtable meeting that we held with our Council of Governors and Board a couple of weeks ago now, which was um, which was uh, a really interesting day that we obviously did virtually under the circumstances, but we did manage to catch quite a lot of feedback from Governor colleagues. This year, from a planning perspective, which is what that uh, session is about, it's going to be obviously different for the NHS. It's going to be heavily dominated by the issues around COVID, but it's really important for us that we continue to move forward on some of our strategic uh, intentions as well, uh, and we will do so. Um, and then um, two linked issues, Fab Change Day, so uh, that was on the 21st of October, and across the group we uh, took Twitter by storm and talked about a number of the innovations and improvements that have been put in place across the group. A lot of sharing took place that day, which was really good to, to see. Um, and indeed, uh, our group widely took part in Fab Change Global Viral Conference. Um, but then finally, the, the estates team. So um, what I thought we would do in, in each of these board papers is, is, is focus a little bit on some good practice. So very much the unsung heroes, the estates team, um, as well as managing a lots of here and now issues. Over the last few months, they've been doing quite a lot of work to the physical environment of our wards and departments to respond to social distancing, but also to make us even safer going into this winter. Um, and um, you know, they 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 always do that work very professionally, very rapidly, uh, and really positive team. And and there's a list of things there that they've been working on. Um, and it's it's great to have such a flexible, supportive team. So uh, great credit to them. Uh, and no doubt a busy winter ahead for them also. 
So I'm happy to take any questions on any of that, Chairman. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, questions or perspective? Simon? Can't hear you, Simon. Yeah, sorry, my finger doesn't move that quickly. I'm here now. So, um, Glenn, just a couple of questions. One's of just for understanding, really. 3,000 increases in tests per lab per day means how many increase in testing overall? And is there a specific impact on us? And, and, the, sub and the second question is, so the system funding envelope, so our risk is 842k this year. But going forward, what are the checks and balances in the system that means we we can't be exposed without any ability to, to manage that risk, I think? Or are there not any checks and balances in the system? OK, so let's just take those two questions in turn. Firstly, on the testing point, um, the capacity that um, is, is now available across the NHS, was, was the intention was to create 500,000 um, tests per annum uh, per, per day, sorry, capacity. Yeah. Uh, and that, that has been achieved across the NHS. But what I refer to here is the next aspiration beyond that, which is to do mass testing, um, uh, in some cases for economic reasons, actually, rather than just health reasons. Yeah. Um, so so the, the uh, use of lab technology will potentially takes up to about four or five million tests per day capability. So, um, so it's quite a significant step up. Um, what we need, though, is the ability to test every single uh, uh, admission to hospital, whether they're elective on a planned pathway or whether they're emergency. And that's what we should have by the end of this month, including that rapid testing capability. In terms of additional testing for us, it will depend on the national strategy for asymptomatic testing of the community or staff and that we're currently not affected by that because obviously we're not in tier three, which is where we currently are. Um, so I think the other question was about checks and balances in the system. And I think one of the one of the really important points that I'm making through some of this starboard work that I'm involved in and indeed some of the national conversations is um, systems are are not um, are not as um, mature as we need them to be in order to manage the resources in the way we're being asked to at the moment. So I would still argue that the organisational governance is strong. Um, so if you take the situation, Kim's just given us an update to our budgets and that will be, uh, that will go down to individual budget holders and we'll hold them to account for that. So, so it's really important that we, we carry out our duties to ensure that we manage our finances uh, and I suppose as a system, we have to, um, we expect all other health bodies in our system to do the same. But I have no leverage to to ensure that that's done other than to listen to the assurances that I get from chief executive colleagues in our system meetings. There's a degree of benchmarking that can, can be carried out, but a lot of that is just really dependent on, on senior finance directors um, reporting into the um, system financial lead so uh, so, I, uh, so whilst um, system governance is important it's it's not it's not the strength through which we're going to manage this winter so organizational governance is key i don't i don't know whether that that answered your question fully enough simon uh, um, glenn i think it did so i fully support the swift managing his governance properly and I think you're just saying in our darkest corners of our nightmares, it's a, there is no checks and balances in this process if people don't behave responsibly, effectively. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, we we can only control what we can control. I think is, yeah, is yeah, what I would yeah, say. No, I yeah. agree. I, I take the point totally. Yeah. Need to to move on, guys, and keep the pace going, please. Jeff. Uh, just very briefly, Glenn, uh, could you just uh, uh, agree or otherwise that uh, NHS providers. Uh, have also seen through the uh, inappropriately named elective incentive scheme. Uh, it does seem to be a disincentive scheme. Uh, are providers on the pitch with this? Yeah, and, and um, I've spoken to National Finance Director and Chief Operating Officer about the, the scheme. Um, I, I don't. I'd be I'd be very surprised if it's implemented in the way that it was originally set out. You know, imagine withdrawing money from um, from Manchester right now because the levels of demand or Liverpool um, because they're not doing their elective work yet they're they're needing resources obviously to manage COVID so it, it's um, let's see what happens. Okay 
Thanks. Okay, team, if there are no further points, we'll canter and if we can try and pick up the pace because we're running about 10 minutes late. Um, Anne, over to you. Thank you, uh, Russell. So this month in the managing director um, commentary, just pulled out some of the um, the key the key points really um, of note. The recovery um, that we've seen um, sort of through August, continued through September 2020, uh, we saw the return to more normal levels of hospital activity, but not quite to where we were sort of pre-COVID. We've seen um, increased use specifically of sort of emergency ambulatory care pathways, the introduction of PAU and so on. Um, and although we didn't deliver our a and &E, uh, performance before in September, we did uh, remain in the upper decile for performance uh, regionally and nationally. So there's that. Um, we've also seen the near normal return um, of our non-COVID health services. And you may remember in the phase three letter that we had a target of returning to um, 80%. By the end of um, by the end of the by the end of September, we we actually achieved um, eighty percent of last year's activity for both the overnight electives and for the outpatient and day case uh, procedures. Of note, and we referenced it yesterday in the non-exec um, um, uh, finance and performance with the improvements in diagnostic uh, wait times. Although we didn't quite achieve the operational standard of less than 1% of patients uh, waiting six weeks or more, but nonetheless, it is a notable achievement. Our cancer performance um, in August remained um, steady, I think it's fair to say. Um, the, the proactive monitoring of the weekly performance continued, with good engagement from operational and clinical uh, teams. And I think a particular note um, are the improvements that we've seen in people waiting for more than 62 days. Um, those now waiting over 104 days now in um, single figures. And we saw a slight deterioration on that um, as part of our unvalidated figures for uh, September. The, 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 the reason and the rationale for that, 30% of that accounted for patient choice. And we're taking some guidance that's been developed at the University um, of Birmingham uh, to, do, to, to support patient uh, choice. A paper's been written, a local process has been drafted, and that will go to uh, Cancer Board um, next, next week. Um, in terms of our quality, I think of note is the, um, is the, the number of reported falls. Um, well, well, that increased the reduction um, in the number of falls with injuries of note. And we heard this morning as part of the digital um, update, the introduction of sensors uh, to proactively uh, prevent falls within our side rooms. And this the use of, increased use of our side rooms by older and more vulnerable people who are admitted from care homes is a necessary part of our infection and um, control management. Um, as part of our COVID um, pathways. So it's really great to see sort of this shift from an introduction in our digital hub into um, implementation and delivery. Our most important metric perhaps in our integrated um, dashboard is our workforce. And it's really pleasing to see that there remains good and sustained progress on workforce metrics, specifically sickness and, 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 and it, that is a really important metric for us as we move forward into into winter and our second and um, COVID surge. Um, it's also positive um, the work that um, will now start following a successful uh, bid around international um, nurse recruitment. And we've already picked up on finance earlier in today's um, meeting. So those are the points I wanted to uh, draw out from the integrated performance dashboard. You're muted, Russell. And that was a really comprehensive uh, overview. Thank you. Glenn, did you want to add something before we go into the detail? Yeah, just very, very briefly. I mean, our, obviously our performance benchmark very well pre-COVID, but we, we have recovered really well. You know, so the, the, the level of activity we, we, we've been able to recover is really positive. So whilst we, we look at those national standards and targets and say we we missed A and E, for example. We we're very much in the top performing trust still nationally, and we should be very proud of that. But just to emphasise Anne's other point, the the most important indicators going into this winter are workforce. Um, so you know it, it isn't about ensuring we get 
so much activity through that we 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 wear our workforce out. We need to be inclusive of them. They want to treat patients. They're working really hard to do that to deliver on their expectations. But we need to keep a very close eye on things over this winter because it will be a tough winter. Absolutely. Colleagues have to move into the detail. OK, and if we can keep the pace going, please. Fiona, first of all. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so I just wanted to um, e echo really what Anne just said. So as you can see from the quality and safety um, KPIs on the dashboard, there are some um, that are below where we want to be, um, uh, namely VTE and the falls, although um, falls with harm has improved this month. That's a year to date um, red indicator you can see there. Um, so, um, yes, there are some um, uh, non-compliances in, in some of our metrics or lower than uh, target, but it is a balance. Um, and if you were to ask me, you know, what I'm worried about, it is the workforce. So I'm balanced, I'm needing to ban, and as we all are, balancing a conversation between the need to be compliant with our standards um, um, but the need for them to be in control and to do the right thing and to have autonomy um, to keep people safe whilst they're busy and um, um, in this um, second surge as we're going through. So um, uh, that's a balancing conversation around um, that compliant behaviour, keeping our standards, but keeping the well well-being um, and, uh, uh, as I say, autonomy of our workforce um, in the same conversation. So that's what we're balancing. I'm I'm pretty happy with um, the KPIs as they stand. Um, they um, and there are some signs of improvement post um, the first wave. Thank you very much, Fiona. Any questions or perspectives to Fiona? Fiona, th thank you for the leadership of you and your senior team um, during the challenging times for the uh, frontline uh, colleagues that we have. Um, let's move on then to um, what would be Helen's report. And do you just want to pull out any key points here? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm com comfortable that I've pulled out the main points as part of uh, my introduction and um, the report that Helen has detailed and, and presented just adds further further information and I'm comfortable to take any questions. Thank you very much, Anne. Any questions or perspectives on Helen's section? OK, John, before you leave, can you put yourself back on mute and maybe take yourself off video? Thank you. Yeah. Okie dokie. Colleagues happy to move on? Uh, so we therefore move on to Anne Pope's section. Anne. Uh, thank you, Russell. We went through um, much of this assurance in Finance and Performance Committee yesterday. So there was nothing I particularly wanted to pull out other than to highlight, um, as Anne has, um, has pointed out, we have been successful in having um, attain some financial support for our international recruitment programme. I think the challenges around that now are going to be more from a sort of logistical travel arrangements, sorting out accommodation for the nurses when they arrive and the pastoral care, particularly during the initial two weeks of quarantine. Um, and we're doing a piece of work with Coventry University and across the system to, to look at how we can best support nurses when they arrive. Um, there's nothing else I particularly wanted to point out, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Anne. Questions and perspectives to Anne? Okie dokie, thank you. So we'll move on to the money. Um, Kim, anything uh, you would like to add? Um, just to highlight really that we claimed £7.3 million pound an additional uh, top up in order to break even. Uh, that is a, a movement really from the previous period, but that reflects the fact that this is the final uh, month uh, really of this retrospective uh, top up arrangement. So we've made every effort to ensure that all relevant spend uh, that can be claimed uh, has been claimed. And it also reflects the settlement uh, that uh, we uh, finalised with uh, the CCG. Uh, our cash position remains strong, uh, and that again is reflective of the fact that we receive a month uh, in advance of, uh, 
or, or of, of the month, sorry, uh, a whole month's uh, worth of allocation. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, questions and perspectives to Kim. This may be um, the year where we make the first loss in 10 plus years, but I don't think we'll ever have sat on such a large cash balance by the end of this year, but time will tell. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, Charles, on the mortality uh, report, anything you would like to pull out? No, just, just to say that mortality uh, remains uh, very firmly within control limits and the um, medical examiner for deaths uh, programme continues to develop. Um, there is one um, new uh, avoidable death you will see in the paper, which was um, a patient um, who had uh, was very ill with a lot of comorbidities, but we felt that um, uh, he, he ultimately died due to a drug reaction that could have been avoidable. Okay, thank you, Charles. Any questions uh, from colleagues on the mortality report? Thank you, Charles. So we we'll therefore move on to the nurse staffing report. Fiona, back with you. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Russell. So this is our um, normal paper that we see every month. And as uh, Anne has already alluded to, our staffing position um, um, across the um, majority of our uh, wards, departments and teams is in a good place from a sickness and a vacancy uh, um, position. And our retention has, uh, has hugely um, improved over the last uh, year or so. Um, I think uh, hotspots in terms of nurse uh, qualified nurse staffing uh, is mainly in the acute ward areas and um, they're namely uh, Fairfax, Nicholas, MAU and, and Mary Ward where the largest vacancy position are. But all of those have had um, input um, from um, the corporate teams um, in relation to leadership development, um, uh, dedicated recruitment activity um, and uh, OD support to, to help um, uh, develop those teams but and also to improve their retention. Um, in terms of um, the other data in the report, maternity, as you can see, um, is in a uh, good um, position. Um, as are the allied healthcare professionals um, with radiology really only standing out as the the main position of uh, of risk. Um, and again, just to give the board assurance that the division has got um, some good uh, plans to improve that. Um, community um, position is missing from this report um, this um, this uh, month. Uh, mainly because of a lack of data, uh, I've been able to obtain data from there at the moment, but I will include a, a, an update on that next month. Um, but I'm not aware of any risks in relation to community staffing. OK, great. Thank you, Fiona. Um, questions and perspectives to Fiona. I've got little doubt that the next few months are going to be tough in a very different way. Um, but similar to uh, the, the degree of challenge that we had in the first wave of COVID. So anything we can do as a board to help um, in terms of the frontline teams uh, sense that the board are very much with them. Um, Fiona, just let us know. But if you can pass that message down, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, we'll therefore move on to the audit committee report from the 14th of October. Rosemary? OK, thank you. I'll take the report as read. Um, just highlight um, really two points. One in terms of the work that internal audit had been doing over the period. They had specifically done some targeted work looking at the financial controls which were in place at the trust over um, the last COVID um, period um, you know, to see when people were working from home, whether that has made any differences to the controls. And um, the very positive assurance that we can, were given was that they provide that the audit provided significant assurance that the appropriate financial controls had were retained over over the period. Um, so that is very positive news. We also had a very useful discussion with the external auditors around the rather um, some of the rather different risks which are going to be affecting the audits this year. We've already talked about the financial, um, the different financial regime and how that will impact on the trust. 
Um, but but also, I, the board should be aware that there are um, two sort of or standards coming in which may um, change the focus of work a bit. First of all, around going concern, and obviously um, um, with a financial deficit being posted for the first time, that will change their focus a little bit. Um, but also with a new standard in place may require them to change the focus of the work in, um, and with more detailed work in some, in some respects. And secondly, we're waiting for new guidance from the National Audit Office in respect of the value for money um, auditing that um, the external auditors are required to do, which is likely to meet, which is likely to be far more prescriptive than it has been in the past. So we'll watch this space, but there may be um, quite a bit of change there in the work that they have to carry out for us. Any questions? Thank you very much, Rosemary. Questions or perspectives to Rosemary? Okie dokie, thank you. So we'll then move on to the Clinical Governance Committee report. Bruce? Um, it's going to be Jeff uh, for this occasion because he was kind enough to chair when I couldn't make it this month. Over to you, Jeff. I have a couple of comments to add afterwards on, on more general points. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, report has read. Uh, I'll, I'll take a couple of comments. Uh, two excellent presentations from the AL for emergency and electives. Um, you know, recognising uh, in the background to those reports the stress that those two areas have been under. Uh, they performed uh, outstandingly, uh, coming back to where you know everybody would love them to be in terms of audit and performance and so on and so forth. Um, so those would be the only pieces to, to really bring out, other than um, uh, we had a, a lovely presentation of an SI from a junior doctor, which was uh, which was refreshing to say the least, and a great a great credit to him, and a great credit credit to his mentors and the organisation generally. He presented extremely well um, and uh, very succinctly. I'll have to take questions. Thank you, Jeff. Just before we take questions, Bruce, did you want to add your couple of points? I can happily do them now. Um, they're not about the meeting. Uh, just to say that um, I've started conversations with uh, Fiona and Charles. Um, firstly, where can we engage junior doctors more in clinical governance, which I think is a, a good thing for the organisation. And secondly, to develop an audit assurance stream for cancer services. Um, I hope to be able to um, update the board in a month or so. OK, great. Thank you, Bruce. A question and perspectives to Jeff. On Bruce's behalf. Uh, Fiona. Yeah, just on that piece um, from Bruce, I'd like just to tell, uh, let the board know and, and the members of the public here that um, I've asked the um, CCG to start a piece of um, work on the patient experience element of um, our, our cancer services across across the um, Coventry and Warwickshire footprint. And that was agreed at the um, quality and safety group um, uh, yesterday across the system. Um, so just for the members of the public that will um, will work up that proposal, but it would be great to have the views of people that use our services um, into um, their experiences. So when as we redesign and restore cancer services, um, we can build them um, to improve patient experience as well as performance. Thank you very much, Fiona. Colleagues happy to move on? And therefore, we move on to Simon's update on the uh, new f and committee. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, I take the report as read, um, and the only two things I think are worth teasing out are where I've highlighted areas of concern, both of which have been mentioned by Glenn and other members of the board during the day. But you know, the, the, the recognition of the importance of managing staff carefully in these very challenging times, and the second of ensuring that again in these challenging times and more command and control environment in the NHS we don't lose sight of the need to continue to drive uh, continuous improvement and productivity within the trust. Thank you Simon. Any questions or perspectives to Simon? Okie dokie so we therefore move on to the patient experience quarterly report. Fiona what would you like to pull out?
If you're talking, Fiona, we can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, Chair. So this report covers uh, June to August. We actually, um, I actually presented it at Patient Care Committee early this month, so they, um, the governors actually um, saw it on Monday. Um, I, uh, the, the main um, sort of focuses of there is that you can see the numbers of com complaints that did drop through um, the first wave of COVID have um, increased back to a normal level, um, although that is remains a, a relatively low level compared to our activity. Um, and also the response rates have improved since as well. Um, what um, in terms of things that we have focused on in the last um, quarter is relaunching FFT. So the I Want Great Care FFT measure that um, is a, a, a national reported um, KPI had ceased through COVID. It is due to start back up being nationally reported in December. Um, and we're just setting up the, the teams and um, and um, uh, uh, feedback systems to, to enable that. Um, the um, the last point that was picked up by um, the governor's action, just for clarity, um, on um, uh, page uh, let me, sorry um, page three of my report, um, there's a table that says the net the areas of complaints and and the the areas in Beaumont and ITU may look worrying, but just to clarify, it is a percentage of um, uh, complaints per um, number of um, patients on the ward and both of those have got very few patients and particularly Beaumont Ward actually closed during part of that period so um, they look worrying but I'm not worried about them. Thank you for that assurance. Uh, questions of perspectives to Fiona on the uh, patient experience report? Okie dokie, then we'll move on to the CQC update, including the insights report. Fiona? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this again is a, um, a report that you see regularly um, that details where we are against our CQC uh, regulation and any actions um, that come out of our inspections and the insights report that they um, um, that um, they publish on a monthly basis for all providers. Um, I think um, I'd like to give the board assurance around um, the engagement meetings that we've recently had. Um, so we had one in September um, about um, uh, uh, in infection prevention and um, CQC have written back that they had full assurance on that uh, following that conversation. And then myself and Helen um, also had a interview um, style meeting with them about preparation for the second wave and winter uh, last week. Uh, we're waiting for that feedback, but initial verbal feedback was that they were assured of our plans around our plans and, um, and preparation. Um, the um, in terms of the detail within the report, as you can see, there's two outstanding actions on our action plan. Both of them relate to pharmacy business cases um, that are being developed um, to better support A&E with pharmacy cover. I think um, it's fair to say both of those have been delayed partly because of COVID and partly because um, the um, the necessity for additional resource, I think, is um, is is being challenged there, and um, just um, there's a, there's a slight um, difference of opinion. So once that's ready to come through, then um, then it will be presented to management board. Um, um, and then um, I think just to give a bit of context, I suppose, for the insights after a question outside of board from one of the, the non-execs. So just to remind you why the CQC insights report comes every uh, quarter. Um, and that is the learning that came from the CQC inspection in, two, in 2016, where um, we were questioned about some national audits and national data, which... Uh, we probably hadn't been cited on at board in terms of any risks or assurance that we need um, against those um, national audits. Um, so the, this paper is presented just to keep us cited on the intelligence that CQC has on us and so that we can be cha challenging ourselves as to whether there um, is any uh, surprises 
um, anything that we need to get more assurance on. Um, I'm, I'd like to assure the board that this is also um, seen and challenged in Clinical Governance Committee as well. Um, and currently there are no surprises. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Fiona. Um, any questions or perspectives to Fiona? Rosemary? Uh, Fiona, one quick question on page um, two of your report action plans were two actions which should have been delivered in October. Um, and I just wanted to check whether they actually were. That relates to the update of the SEND system. And then there was a business case for the. Yeah, so the, the thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Yes, I can give you assurance that the SEND system was updated um, and the NIV business case. Um, uh, wasn't in terms of management board, but has been agreed in terms of our COVID second wave CPAP pathway. So the resources have gone in there as on the back of, of COVID rather than a separate business case. Okay, thank you, Fiona. That's helpful. And any other questions to Fiona? Rosemary, if I could just ask you to take your hand down, that would be helpful. So we move on then to um, the Digital Health Board quarterly report. We had an update on this earlier from Adam, but Glenn, on Helen's behalf, anything you want to add? Yeah, as you say, Russell, we went through some of this in quite some detail this morning. A um, lot of activity um, with the IT team in terms of the deployment of technology to support virtual clinics, for example, plus, plus a lot of change programmes, including our EPR replacement. And, and the digital hub, as you say, it is not on our website yet. The reason for that is that we are waiting for a, the launch day um, this month. Um, and I, I can report that we we will have a, a pre-record from the Secretary of State for Health because it's a project that he's particularly excited by. So he'll be taking part in that. So as soon as that's launched, there'll be more data on the website. But I'm happy to take any questions that weren't covered off this morning. OK, great. Thank you, Glenn. Any questions or perspectives to Glenn? I really can't emphasise enough to members of the public how exciting uh, what we're doing now on digital health is. Um, and Anne referred to it earlier, some of the uh, remote technology that we're uh, experimenting with um, is truly revolutionary. So I think that's incredibly exciting. Rosemary, your hand's gone back mm -hmm. up. Yes, it has. Yes, I just wanted to um, inquire about the, the work embedding virtual outpatients and the technology to be used there. As I understand it, at the moment, all the virtual um, clinics take place via telephone, whilst in some cases, it, um, you know, a, a video conference would, you know, video call may be more appropriate. And I just wondered where where we were in taking either just telephone or a mix of routes for contacting people through yeah there, there, i mean there is the capability and there has been some use of, of of digital in terms of video clinics um and indeed elsewhere in the group uh, i think we saw at the three boards meeting didn't we some of the experiences they had in in wide valley so some good learning on that um, we are though finding that telephone um, follow-up works pretty well for, for a lot of patients, but um, I would see us pushing a little bit harder on a probably a more willing public to look at the use of video support. Um, there are still quite a few patients who come back to us and say we want to be seen face to face and we'll always make that uh, available. Um, and one of the things I'll be looking at carefully on this is whether the use of virtual clinics, whether they're telephone or video, is increasing the level of diagnostic requesting because that that's one of the experiences I picked up from colleagues elsewhere. But um, we will we will this will be a feature of the way we deliver services into the future. There is no doubt of that. Excellent. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rosemary. Colleagues, happy to move on. And then I think we've all had different versions of the um, COVID nineteen update. But Glenn, anything you wanted to pull out? Yeah, I mean, just uh, so the, the paper sets out where we are with it. I mean, the, the level of bed occupancy across the NHS is, is very high at the moment and rising. Um, and there are some demand projections that unmitigated demand projections that do look a bit scary for the next few weeks. So we will continue to to manage our situation. Well, we currently have 23 COVID positive patients in, in beds in, in South Warwickshire, five in, in critical care. 
Critical care demand across the system has increased though. Um, we've been providing a bit of mutual aid to UHCW and into Birmingham over the last week, um, not for COVID patients because we tend to not try to move COVID patients, but for other critical care activity. Um, key things for this wind, I mean, one of the reasons why the occupancy is high is because we, in the first wave, we stopped doing a lot of elective work in order to prepare for, for, for the unknown surge um, this time we're continuing elective work and we touched on that earlier, uh, you know, we're doing high levels of, of, of elective work and we're already seeing the, the normal winter demand coming in as well. So that's why things are busier. Um, getting the rapid testing in place will be key, as I said earlier, the um, escalation processes and how we manage the wards, um, particularly if there are staffing issues over the winter is another thing we'll be doing some more work on so that particularly around on-call arrangements, those are a bit more robust. Um, and then maintaining the well-being of the workforce will be key, but um, a lot going on, as you can see in Helen's report. Thank you, Glenn. Any questions or perspectives to Glenn? And, and probably the one other thing I should have said, Chairman, is that the flu vaccination campaign has, has started very well with high numbers of staff take up. Um, and people may have seen in one of the national papers, we are preparing for a COVID vaccine to be available not that it, we are certain of this, but to be available from December to um, to, to to give to high risk groups, including healthcare workers. Yeah. OK, super. Thank you, Glenn. I don't normally like my chief executives being on the front page of the mail on Sunday, um, but in that case, um, it was absolutely right for you to be so. Um, let's move on then for items for noting and information. The first are the summary of ratified policies. Anne, anything you wanted to add? Just to say there are two uh, here today, the Police Request for Information Policy and the South Warwickshire Foundation Trust Policy Card. Um, so it's for noting and there's further information on both of those included within the detail of the paper. Thank you, Anne. Any questions to Anne on the ratified policies? Julie noted. Thank you, Anne. And then the sustainability strategy, the annual update, Sophie. Thanks, Russell. So um, this paper just shows the progress that we've made against the strategy we set. It's a five year strategy and we're about a year into it. And actually we've made some significant progress already against some of those targets. The strategy should never stand still. So the other thing this paper does is reflect the new guidance that's come out and shows what um, additional targets we've ad adopted into the strategy. And then finally, I think it's just the assurance that our bi month meeting with all the leads is continuing to drive forward our sustainability agenda as a trust but I think moving forward in the next um, couple of years it's going to be partnership working that really helps us to make that impact because all partners currently at a place and assistant level have identified sustainability as one of their key objectives and actually by working together I think we can achieve a, a lot more so so I think that will be a focus um, for the next 12 months I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you Sophie. Questions and perspectives Glenn? Yeah, so there's now an anchor institutions group that's been set up with health and local authority colleagues across Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, as Sophie said, sustainability is, is an area that we, we could definitely be more coordinated on. Um, and so I've, we met last week, I'm particularly emphasising the need for sustainability to be number one on, on those list of actions. So we'll, 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 we'll be doing a lot more joined up work on it. Thank you, Glenn. Colleagues, happy to move on. And uh, therefore, we we'll move on to the board committee minutes, the open meetings. So the first is Bruce from the 9th of September. Um, anything you wanted to add to the Clinical Governance Committee? Uh, nothing to add, Chair. Okay, any questions or perspectives to Bruce? Thank you for everyone involved in uh, that subcommittee. And then the 8th of September Finance and Performance Committee. Simon, anything you wanted to add? Uh, nothing to add, Chair. Thank you. Any questions um, or perspectives to Simon? Thank you, everyone who's involved in that. And then finally, the Audit Committee of the 9th of September. Anything that you wanted to add, Rosemary? Nothing to add, Chair. Thank you, Rosemary. Any questions or perspectives from colleagues? Okie dokie. Any other business? Please raise your hands if you have any other business. 
Fiona's just reminded us um, that the flu jab percentage figure is now 65% in just four weeks, which is fantastic. So um, it really is important, and I couldn't emphasize enough to members of the public um, for you to get your flu jab if you are in an at risk group. Um, any, I haven't had been notified of any questions from governors or members of the public, but if uh, there are, could you raise your hands, please? OK, uh, Roger. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, one question really for Fiona in terms of her CQC insight report. There's reference in her report that an, an amounts of data that the CQC seem to be looking at is significantly out of date um, along the, the lines that um, everything is moving at um, maximum speed, uh, COVID boosting everything. The idea of looking at something that was uh, 2019, frankly, uh, is ludicrous and uh, a waste of executive time. Um, Shall I answer that, Fiona? <laughs> uh, so, well, that, that is a, a perspective, Roger, but clearly with our regulator, when our regulator wants us to do things, we do things. And um, like I'm sure you would want, we want to do everything possible to ensure the quality and safety of everything we do. But uh, your, your perspective is duly noted. Fiona, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, Roger, thank you. I think that, that that's why I kind of gave it the context I did today, um, just to say, you know, uh, it, it's worth looking at the data that they're looking at, but that's that, you know, and to ask ourselves, does it tell us anything we don't know? But apart from that, um, it's kind of head, heads up, really, that's all. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, thank uh, you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I note the uh, the level of comment. Um, and any other questions from members of the public? Okie dokie. Well, it doesn't feel like it at the moment, but Christmas is coming and our last mould is um, next month. So I look forward to uh, seeing you at the 2nd of December uh, for the public board, if not before. Uh, with members of the Council of Governors um, team, we'll have a five minute comfort break and then we'll dial into the confidential board. Thank you very much. <laughs>